to Board Game Breakfast. Hey, we were running a contest throughout the month of August and that contest is now over. After almost 3,500 entries, which was wow, that's a lot of folks who wanted to win. We're very excited for that. Um, we did a random search for the winner and it is Chester Wilson. Congratulations, Chester. Uh, give me an email and we'll talk about how you can get your $50 gift certificate. But actually it doesn't matter because this Friday uh, in a live show, we'll probably do a live show on Friday, where we will draw from Chester and the other winners from the different shows in the Dice Tower Network to see who wins the big $500 gift certificate from Cool Stuff. So that's pretty exciting. Um, other things that are exciting, Essen is coming up. That's the, the Essen Spiel Fair, which happens in Germany in October. And we're going to be there. We're gonna be in Hall 7, have a booth there. And we're also gonna be doing a live show there. Now, our live show is gonna be at four o'clock on Thursday. I know it's not the optimal time, but because of just different things, it was really the only time we could get. And so if you would like to come to that show, we want you to swing by the booth on Thursday as soon as you can and get a ticket. The tickets are free, but we just we only have limited seating for the show. And so it'll be me and, and Eric and Z and maybe a few other folks will be there to say hi and do a 90-minute show or so. And even if you can't make that show, we hope you can come by and say hi to us at our booth. We might have a few promos there. Promos! Folks! A lot of people have been asking about Arcadia Quest, Dead of Winter, and different promos. The promos are now available at Cool Stuff. There will be a link. I'll put the link down in the description of this video where you can see the different promos. Now, realize when you get these promos, you can add them to your Cool Stuff orders and stuff, but the money is going to the Dice Tower. Um, so that's a donation to the Dice Tower for the different things there. So we just wanted to make sure that we had taken care of the Kickstarter stuff before we put them up, but now they're up. Anyhow, it's time for news. Okay, so what's in the news this week? Well, last week was the PAX convention, PAX Prime, and that's mostly a video game convention, but there is some board game stuff there. Some people saw Portal for sale there. But also, the Magic the Gathering, they announced an expansion there, the Battle for Xandabar. Not the Magic the Gathering card game, but the Magic the Gathering board game. This is supposed to come out in January or so. Yay! Wish it had come out when the game came out, but whatever. Looks like it adds two more Planeswalkers. One is a dual color Planeswalker and some more units and things like that. So I look forward to just being able to customize the game a little bit. Hey, the word meeple is now an official word according to the Oxford Dictionary. All right, well, maybe Dice Tower can get in there after that point. But anyhow, now you can legally say meeple, I guess. I guess you can use it in Scrabble. Who's playing Scrabble? Okay. Odin's Ravens is a Kickstarter that uh, was not one of the shining moments of Kickstarter because who, the guy who ran it basically just ran off with everyone's money, which is unfortunate. However, the game is going to be picked up by Osprey Games. Osprey Games is going to be publishing this, and it looks really good, the art and everything, and they're going to be sending it out to the people who back that Kickstarter. So that's very nice of them, and that's cool to see this cool two-player racing game come back into print. Hasbro is doing crowdfunding. I know. I mean, if that's it, right? I mean, once Hasbro does crowdfunding, everyone does it. They're actually teaming up with Indiegogo, which if you don't know, is what people use when they can't use Kickstarter. Um, and they're going to be doing some sort of design contest where for party games, and so you can be involved in this contest, and then they'll run it through uh, Indiegogo and such. Why Hasbro's using Indiegogo rather than just publishing it straight up? I don't know, but it's certainly an interesting development. Tree Frog, which is the small company Martin Wallace runs and publishes his games under, he's basically said he'll be no longer publishing games. However, he will basically be a design studio putting his games out underneath other companies. 
Uh, and then Portal Games has announced Niroshima Convoy. Convoy is a two-player game that they published a few years ago. Very fun game uh, where one person's running a convoy of, you know, basically army vehicles. The other person's the rebels trying to blow them up on the way. Really cool asymmetrical two-player game. Um, I guess it didn't do so well. They kind of streamlined it a bit, made sure people knew what's in the Niroshima uh, universe. And so that's going to be reprinted. Look forward to that. Okay, so here in Whitleypedia, we try to talk a little bit about more than just board games. Uh, for example, we've talked a lot about Dungeons and & Dragons, and we had a segment where we've talked a lot about movies. So, it would make sense that we would talk about the news that there will be another upcoming movie based on the Dungeons & Dragons intellectual property. I was just as surprised to see this news as many of you no doubt were. Um, the first one, which came out 15 years ago, was not particularly well received. Uh, in fact, you could say that to enjoy it, you'd have to have a Feeble Mind spell cast on you. I'd have to put a Feeble Mind spell on myself to want to take you home. <laughs> oh. 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 Now, with the end of the Hobbit franchise, and with the Harry Potter franchise long in the rearview mirror, uh, there's a feeling, no doubt, in a lot of offices in Hollywood that it's time for another fantasy-related franchise to come and take over. So, when I talked about this subject earlier this year, I pointed out how, for Wizards of the Coast, which, do, which owns Dungeons & Dragons, its real moneymaker is Magic the Gathering. Uh, and it is already developing a Magic the Gathering movie. See, but in terms of name recognition, D&D can cast a much wider net with a larger, non-geek audience. Now, the weird thing is that the Dungeons & Dragons movie is being produced by Warner Brothers, whereas the Magic the Gathering movie is being done by 20th Century Fox. And, oh yes, the World of Warcraft movie, released by Universal Pictures. So, if you're interested in a large fantasy cinematic universe like Marvel, where Driz Doerden and Sir Anduin Lothar team up with a bunch of planeswalkers so they can all go rescue the Black Lotus from a bunch of horde beholders called the Behorders, well, it probably isn't going to happen. I'm sorry. But so, how do you make... The Dungeons and Dragons movie successful. How do you do it viably and avoid the mistakes of the past? Well, that's what we'll discuss next time. Hey, Tom Vassell here, Jason Levine, and we are talking with a question today from Aaron, who asked us how we take our games to game night. You know, he goes and says at game night right now he's using a medium-sized duffel bag, but. What do we do to transport our stuff? For me, usually I... He leaves uh, all his games at home. I do leave them at home. I hardly bring stuff. But, um, like today, for example, I have four games with me. I just carried them as boxes, and I just carry a stack of boxes. What if it rains? If it rains, then I take my shirt, I go, I tuck them under the shirt, and I protect them with my shirt. That's why I wear nice, loose... Um, t-shirts because then you that's could, why you wear nice loose t-shirts. <laughs> that's, that's why you could One so out. you could cover your games in case of rain. Right. Um, but I know when well, I do bring a lot of games, which is once in a while for a big big meetup, I'll bring the IKEA bag. That seems to be a very good solution. They're huge and they carry a lot of things. Yeah, a lot of people like the IKEA bags. Um, I've used them in the past, but what I normally use is I use um, Rubbermaid type containers. However, I'm very finicky on what I use because Rubbermaid containers most of them curve in towards the bottom which makes them really annoying for games because you stick the games in and as you get higher there's more space near top so I want them as straight as possible when they go down um, I actually have a really nice black chest that I got at Walmart that had wheels on one end so I could pull it um, when, I, when I walked around with it and that thing fits the Ticket to Ride style games I put two of them next to each other yes. and another one on the sides so I'm really happy with that and it fits in the trunk of my car um, if I was traveling really far like we used to go to a college campus where we had to walk pretty far to get there I would get one of those little shopping cart with wheels, I think, and carry my games that way. Yes, I think that's the best way to do it. Anyway, those are some of the things. Ikea, how many gamers have gone there just to get the bags? We'll never know. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. And the shelves, too. Jason Levine. And you can email us at uh, dicearire at gmail.com and ask us questions. <laughs>
news coming out from us this week. I myself am going to be doing the Space Cadets Away mission, Edison, Tesla vs. Edison, uh, Homeland the Game from uh, Gale Force 9, Sa the new version of Samurai from Fantasy Flight, Smash Up, the Munchkin Edition, the Legendary Secret Wars, um, the new War of Light expansion for Dice Masters, the expansion for Good Cop, Bad Cop, um, Dead Men Tell No Tales. So several different games from us. We're also going to do some live gaming this week if we can pull that off. We'll be showing some off on Wednesday. Hopefully we'll be taking a look at the uh, game Rum and Bones. And we'll also be doing a, a hopefully Blood Rage uh, on Friday. So those are a couple live games coming out this week. Um, there is also a board game Blender. If you've never watched Board Game Blender, I encourage you to do so. It's kind of like Board Game Breakfast, but it's Z's version of that. And we got some other stuff. Sam will be doing some reviews. Z will be doing some reviews. So stay tuned. Also check out all of our podcasts. All of this can be found at Dicetower.com. Oh, oh, hi, uh, Chaz Marler from Paradise Paris. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm a little befuddled this week because I accidentally find myself in the middle of this surprise miniseries about the many aspects of board gaming that there is to enjoy other than the gameplay itself. So, might as well continue with the next facet of board gaming, competition. Now, not more than two weeks ago, I found myself more than two and a half hours into a four-player game of Orleans. Or possibly or Orleans? Or How you pronounce it isn't important. What is important is that, you know, this was just a friendly little game. You know, we were all joking and having a good time because, you know, because I was involved. I'm infectious. That is to say, I've often been told I have the personality of a virus. Anyway, the game Orleans is comprised of several little boards, and on one of these boards is a map populated with the cities that are connected by roads and rivers. One way players earn points is by building trading posts in these cities. However, each city may contain only one player's trading post, so it's first come, first serve. Well, we were no less than two rounds away from the game's end, and I was on track to actually not come in last place. Oh, but then, just at the last possible moment, the player right before me got a lucky break, hedged ahead of me, and built the trading post right where I was planning on going, completely destroying the master plan that I had been developing over the course of the entire afternoon. Then I experienced something that hasn't happened to me in years. Seeing my chance at not coming in last place ripped away from my clutches. A flash of competitive anger burned over me. My face went flush, and the primitive part of my brain took over, and I genuinely considered just losing my mind right there in front of everybody. Fortunately, the rational part of my brain soon caught up with me within milliseconds and reminded me that, you know, <laughs> it's just a game. And in the scheme of things, it really didn't matter. But my momentary, prickly competitive outrage really surprised me. Especially since competition is pretty much central in the whole concept of gaming. You know, of course, varying levels of competition are available in games. And I even know several people who don't play games at all because they dislike competition. Hmm. So, is that internal competitive fury that motivates a gamer a dangerous thing? Or is a little competition a healthy thing and another benefit of the board game hobby? Let me know what your experience has been about this aspect of the general whatnot of board gaming that we all love so much. <laughs> Dice Tower. This week I reviewed three games, the first of which is the Atlanteans expansion for Imperial Settlers. Fantastic expansion, and this just continues to improve upon the base game and the previous expansion. The game just gets better and better and better, and it's really fun to play. I highly recommend picking up the base game if you don't have it. The next game I reviewed is Mage Wars Academy, which is not an expansion for Mage Wars, but sort of its own standalone satellite project that can be incorporated back into Mage Wars Arena. I felt it was a little bit lacking in content, but on the other hand, it has a price point that makes sense, and it's very much an introductory 
product. If you haven't tried Mage Wars or if you didn't like Mage Wars, I would definitely take a look at it. Finally, I reviewed Discoveries, which is a uh, dice game from the makers of Lewis and Clark. Same artist, same designer. Fantastic. Has a lot of similarities in, as Lewis and Clark. Uh, if you like Euros, if you like kind of dice manipulation and stuff like that, uh, lots of cool different special abilities and stuff that you can acquire. Definitely take a look at Discoveries. Thanks. Hey now people, my name is Nick from Board Game Brawl and over on my channel I reviewed five games last week. Let me tell you just a little bit about them. First is Bad Beats from Stoneblade Entertainment. This is a little bl light bluffing game for families and kids like Koo, but really you might as well just play Koo. This one is not very good. It's padded out with extra stuff you just don't need. Then we had Rubbish Auction from Japan Brand in Minimal Games. It's got bad components, but it's got this really interesting bidding system and I don't normally like bidding where you're trying to get junk items and then bid as much as you possibly can but not too much, not enough. Really hard to describe, really cool. Check it out if you ever get the opportunity. Then there is the Strange Remnants expansion for Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror is a top five game for me, so there's no way I wouldn't like this expansion. The ancient one in this set is not that great, but the characters are awesome, and there's tons of new spells and items that are definitely interesting. So again, Eldritch Horror, fantastic game. If you love it, get this expansion. Then we move on to Time Bomb, also from Japan brand in Minimal Games. This is like good cop, bad cop meets the resistance, but takes away all the uh, little extra stuff in those games just distills it down to going back and forth, lying, trying not to get caught lying, yelling at people for lying when you're trying to defuse a bomb, which is, it's just a super cool game with ugly artwork, but hopefully it gets reprinted very soon. And then finally, we have Discoveries from Ludonauts and Asmodee, which is one of the big buzzy games coming out of Gen Con, and it is well worth that uh, admiration. This game comes from, a, it's the same designer, and it's a spiritual successor as Ludonauts, and Clark, but in my opinion, it blows that one out of the water. It's a dice allocation system with really beautiful artwork. There's lots of reviews for it now. Check it out. You'll, you might be surprised how much you enjoy this game, so pick it up when it comes out. Thanks very much. Take care. Hello, my friends. It's Game Boy Geek. Last week, here's the three games I reviewed. First is the Little Red Riding Hood. This is the uh, fifth game in the series of the Tales and Games series, all of which, which I've loved. Two of those made my top 100 list. Love this series. This one was the only one that I did not like at this point. It's the only one I'm not keeping. For me, it was very randomish. And then when you played the advanced game, it was to the point where the best part about it was guessing and bluffing. And I felt like the one before this, the Ant and the Grasshopper did that in a much better, more enjoyable way. The next one is Game Election. This is a game, a five minute game, to figure out which game you're gonna play. If your group ever sits around and spends too much time figuring out which game to play, you gotta get this. Some groups never have this problem, you don't need this. If you ever spend more than five minutes deciding which game you're gonna play, get this thing. It's really cool, go watch how it works. The last one is Medieval Academy. I played this first at BGG Con last year, fell in love with it, waited a long time for Yellow to reprint this and to bring it to the US. Amazing, great gateway family style drafting game that has an easy version and an advanced version. This is like Spiel de Jahres material in my opinion. Go check that out. Hey, hey, breakfast people. Last week I did five reviews. I did Murder of Crows, which is a light take that game. Looks good, not a very good game. Uh, too forgettable. I did Yak, which is a, uh, a bluffing sort of liar's dice made with cards sort of game. And it was okay. I was actually a little bit disappointed. I was hoping it would be better, but it was um, a little too samey ultimately. I did a review of a Japanese card game called Go Da Cheese, which is a nice uh, light card game. You are playing some cards face down, trying to bluff, trying to score the most points. That one I like. Good looking game. And I did two expansions. I did the expansion to Takenoko, Takenoko Chibis. Thumbs up all the way for that. If you like the game, get on board with this expansion. And I did the expansion to Five Tribes, the Artisans of Nakawa. And that is through the roof awesome. Get this expansion. If you don't have the base game, get the base game, then get the expansion. All right? Catch you later, folks. Just here to share with you what I've been reviewing this week. And uh, this stack is pretty much what I've got here. Uh, I have been uh, reviewing this little game here called Titan's Tactics. This is the expansion box for it. Reviewed the base game and this guy. Then I also reviewed this game right here from AEG called Planes. Then ugh, 
reviewed this monster. My goodness, there's so much in there. A little bit of a long video, sorry folks, but it's because there's so much in there. Look at that, wow. And then also reviewed this bad guy right here. Well, good guy rather. Um, check out my review of Hoplomachus Origins that'll be hitting the airwaves soon enough. And then I also reviewed a game called 10 Days in the USA from Out of the Box Games. And uh, I don't have the box here to uh, show you. You'll have to watch the video to understand why it's not here any longer. That's what I've been reviewing, folks. See you next time. For me, last week was a really good week in that I only reviewed one game I didn't like that much, and that was RU. Or Ryu, this is a dragon game where you're building your own mechanical dragon with resources, has amazing artwork, but the gameplay was just very boring and repetitive, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And looks great, but unfortunately wasn't very fun. Monster Factory, this is kind of like Carcassonne for kids, but you're building monsters instead. The gameplay is okay. Where the game really shines is just opening up the box and letting kids take these tiles and build all sorts of weird and crazy monsters. Then we have WWE Showdown. Uh, now, if you like the WWE or wrestling at all, the theme here is perfectly done and put on, and you're really going to get a kick out of this game. The gameplay is not, you know, anything too spectacular, but it really does feel like you have two wrestlers who are tag teaming in a ring or just different things going on. Really nails that quite well. Discoveries is the dice game version of uh, Lewis and Clark. And I thought it was really cool. Has this neat dice allocation system, kind of a, a dice uh, recycling type system, which I thought was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Sam and Z both loved it. Check out our Miami Dice review for that. Vault Wars is a game in which you are bidding on a vault full of fantasy items. You know some of this stuff in the vault, but not all of it. So that's a pretty cool little auction game. Civilizations, which is a civilization game, but more of a tableau building game where you're putting cards out in front of you, using resources, playing cards, action cards from your hands that have different results depending on how many other players played that same card. Some pretty cool artwork too. Uh, Warband. This is a game that looks like a war game, but it's actually a Euro game, but I found it very interesting. Uh, it's very, some very refreshing, interesting mechanisms I haven't seen before, and the player interaction in this game was really high back and forth between the different players because everything you do affects every move everyone else makes, which I found very fascinating. The Cash and Guns expansion, which I found amazing. There's not a lot of spectacular stuff here. More cash, more guns. That's really what's in it. A few more guns and a few more cards. It's an instant ad. I would teach it to new people, and happily I can keep it because it all fits in the original box. Barely. Ashes is a great two-player game. That's more than two players, I guess, but mostly a two-player game that's uh, going to be reminiscent of uh, the Magic the Gathering and games like that where you have a phoenix born going up against someone else using dice, and it's really neat. There's six factions in the box. They're very diverse, and I like it all very much. My only qualm was it's very similar in theme to many other games, and I didn't know if it brought anything that spectacularly new to the table. And then finally, One Night Revolution, which I found amazing. For me, it was a one night werewolf killer. I like the idea of just having the different things going around, um, different roles, it mixed resistance, and One Night Ultimate Werewolf together very well. This is one I kept. I replaced Convoy, because as I said in the news, uh, they're going to be remaking that one soon. And Dungeon Guilds, which is a very fun go into the dungeon game, but uh, I like One Night Revolution better. You know what really irritates me, and that is when I get a little mini expansion for some game, and I have to keep the sprue because the instructions are printed on it, like Zuloretto or Dungeon Twister. Many different games have these, where I'll get it like, ooh, here, punch out these tiles. So I punch out the tiles. Yay, now how do I use these tiles? Oh, the rules are written here on this thing I just punched them out of, which means I need to keep this thing I just punched them out of. I don't want to keep this. It doesn't fit with all the other pieces. When I want to look for the rules, i got to find this thing. So I've cut out the, diff you know, the, the instructions sometimes, but still, just kind of a pain in the neck. Just include a little piece of paper there that I can stick with the rules. Hello and welcome to Board Games and Bowties. My name is Mike and today we're going to continue our conversation on gateway gaming. These are just a few helpful tips that I use to introduce new people to new games. 
something super helpful that I've found in introducing new people to new games. If you can't get them into the theme, say you're introducing them to something like Settlers of Catan with barely any theme at all, is comparing your game to other games. And I'm not talking about comparing Arkham Horror to Eldritch Horror, but comparing your designer game to games your friends may have played before. Oftentimes, this can be a little bit of a stretch, because for our friends that only know how to play Crazy Eights and Uno, there's not going to be much room for comparison. That's why I always try to find a similar mechanic. In most games that we play, there's something familiar that we can find for our non-gamer friends. Whether it's the poker hands in Dice Town, or the re-rolling of dice in Raw the Dice game like in Yahtzee, maybe it's the area control of Small World like in Risk, or the Moncala mechanic like in Five Tribes. You can usually find something. Another great thing to do is ask your friends what games they have played, which ones they like, and why. If my friend says they hate Risk, I may skip over Small World on game night, but just because they love Monopoly doesn't mean they're going to like Power Grid. The why is really important. So that's all for today. Find mechanics similar to other games your friends like, and in my experience, this makes it much easier to get them into a game that you actually want to play and saves you from another game night full of getting your turn skipped in Uno. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Board Games and Bowties. I'm Mike. We'll see you later. Folks, there's no question that Kickstarter has changed the landscape of board gaming. It's certainly something that one of the biggest changes to board gaming. It's a, a force to be reckoned with. Since Alien Frontiers really kind of brought it to the forefront, many other games have come out. And there's many games coming out via Kickstarter each year. Now, not all games come out from Kickstarter each year. And the top games, ranked games from each year, are still a majority of not being Kickstarter. But that may change. Now, I like Kickstarter. I use Kickstarter. I back things on Kickstarter. I run my own show's funding via Kickstarter. But Kickstarter has both pros and cons. And I thought I would talk about some of the pros and cons uh, on, on these videos. So this week I'm going to talk about the cons of Kickstarter's problems that uh, Kickstarter has, and especially specifically in regards to board gaming. And then next week we'll talk about the pros of Kickstarter. I don't want you to think that I'm just all negative. I'm going to be all negative today. But I don't want you to think I'm negative about Kickstarter. I think there's many great things. So come back next week and we'll talk about those. But what, are, what problems currently reside in Kickstarter? And then maybe in a few weeks we'll talk about some solutions and things I can, I can think for these. The first is just hucksters and con men and people who will just actively steal your money, sometimes deliberately, as probably happened with Odin's Ravens, and sometimes just because uh, things got away from them. But there are many projects, at least 10 that I can think of in the board game world, where people simply just lost their money and they're never going to get it back. There's also a lack of preparation in Kickstarter. Now, f hopefully this will kill the Kickstarter where they don't get there and they don't have anything ready. There's no artwork ready. Sometimes the game is not yet ready. Sometimes it's just a concept and you're kind of doing that. Now, most of those Kickstarters these days are not succeeding and I'm glad for that. But I think even more problematic is there's also a lack of preparation for success. See, sometimes these guys come in and, and they do Kickstarter and it's a rousing success and then they don't know how to handle that. I didn't realize 4,000 people were going to want to buy this item. And so now I got to figure out, I have to increase all my numbers and many times it drives these people into bankruptcy and problems and sometimes a lack of fulfillment because they just didn't expect that that many people were going to be interested in that. Now that can be the other way. The first one I mentioned, a lack of preparation, where people want a specific amount of funds and they actually should have put a much higher amount there because they didn't realize how many different costs that they were going to have. Then we have a lack of real information for the consumer. And this will tie into my next point, which is the hype machine. Now there's two things. Now, Consumers are coming into Kickstarter and they're looking at it and they usually see a bunch of paid previews which are people who are paid to look at the game or people who have been given the game and have done a positive preview. There's very few people out there who are looking at Kickstarter projects and saying, nah, this one's not very good. 
So you're going to see a huge amount of hype, a huge amount of positive information about every game on Kickstarter. And that's very difficult for the consumer because the consumer has to say, well, they're all good, I guess, but they're not. They're not all good. In fact, I'd say 80 to 90% of them are not good. So how do you determine which ones are good? That can be very difficult. Now, some people have said, well, this is the same thing with retail, ga retail games, but that's not the case because in retail games, there's reviewers out there who are saying it's good or it's bad. You can actually talk to people who have bought the game already and they'll tell you whether it's good or bad, but there is a super strong hype machine because the whole point of the Kickstarter is back it and we'll get this. And then with the way the Kickstarter um, uh, community and uh, culture has trended, we have stretch goals and we have other things. And because of things like stretch goals, people want the Kickstarter to go higher so they go out and they tell everyone this is the greatest thing ever and this is the greatest thing ever and this is the greatest thing ever and the hype machine is so noisy and so loud that it's hard to really hear any kind of real criticism of these games until after they're published later on which again makes it difficult for people who wanted to get in on them early and then that leads us into the problems with the exclusives and things that you can only get if you back the kickstarter and some kickstarters were the only way to get the game was to kickstart it this also perpetuates the cult of the future. Uh, this is a problem with Kickstarter in a sense that it's always about, here's what's coming out, here's what's coming out, here's what's coming out, to the point where I know people who are getting the Kickstarter games, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, but look at this, what I can now kickstart. And it's like, guys, play the games that you have now. But it's always about, this game's coming out, this game's coming out, they're coming, they're coming. And many times they're very, very late. And that's a problem here is the lateness here. A lot of the people who run Kickstarter simply do not understand logistics and distribution. It's very difficult. And even those who do understand it, it can be very difficult. Any sort of problem, unexpected problems can be very, uh, can slow down the whole project. And because of the hype machine, this usually has a negative backlash, right? If I make a game and I say, I'm making a game and eventually it's published, I'm like, here's the game. But if I've been talking about this game and I said this game is going to come out in May 2015 and then it turns into December 2018, everyone will get furious and incensed because people get really invested into these um, projects. Kickstarter is still not yet also a friend of the retail stores and distribution. Now they say they are and you'll find a one or two retail stores that tell you that they are, but the simple fact is, is that it does not help the local store. So for the people out there who are like, bro, say, you know, help the friendly local gaming store, Kickstarter isn't their friend. Now they'll say they are, different projects will do their best, but the simple fact is, when all the frontline gamers, 4,000, 5,000 gamers, are buying the games through Kickstarter, I've talked to distributors, I've talked to people, the majority of Kickstarter games have a huge drop off and do not sell that well in the stores and online. There are exceptions to that, of course, but most of them do not, and it's not very useful for stores to carry Kickstarter games, and again, that's because of the hype and the cold of the future, because people are like, oh yeah, that game's are, I already heard about that one, but there's another one I can get in the future. There's no filter. I know, this is the one I'll get the feedback on. But the fact is, is that publishers are there for a reason. They're putting their money on the line so they can sit there and go, hmm, this game's okay, but it could be better. This game could be done better. So with Kickstarter, as I said earlier, 80 to 90% of it is simply garbage. Now, whenever I say things like this, people are like, ah, oh, publish games, it's the same way. No, it really isn't. It really isn't. Uh, we review a lot of games here at the Dice Tower, and we see a lot of great games, and we see a lot of bad games. We see a lot of terrible games that come out through published channels. That's, that's the truth of it. But the Kickstarter ratio is much, 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 much higher. There is simply a ton of really bad games that come from out there. Then there's a lack of professionalism. Now, well, usually when I say, hey, here's a Kickstarter game, and here's a game that's not a Kickstarter, and I mix them up and I say, which one's which, almost always, you can pick out the Kickstarter game. Because the graphic design just looks like it's a Kickstarter. Because they did some really weird things here. They don't know how to deal with the different distributors and get their games out there. They, there's just some awkwardness, and it just has a Kickstarter look, we call it. There's that lack of professional touching to it. Now, again, that's not found in every game. There are some games, Kickstarter games out there, which are very professionally done. Um, but for the most part, that is what we see in many Kickstarter games. And so 
I'm not saying Kickstarter is bad, and I'm not saying every game follows these things. And in fact, like I said, next week I'll talk about really good things from Kickstarter because it has done many good things for the hobby in general. But I do think these are things that we have to look at. We have to say, okay, how can we fix these things? How can this be changed? Kickstarter is a fantastic tool, but it can be misused and it often is. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Solo play games are often perfect for porting to an app experience, but there aren't that many board games that are designed for solo play. One of those games is Infection, Humanity's Last Gasp, so let's take a quick look at its iOS port. Published by Victory Point Games, Infection is similar thematically to Pandemic, but is completely optimized for a solo play experience. Trying to cure a deadly virus that has broken out, you must gather proteins to counteract different molecules of that virus. It's basically a form of set collection. You have to deal with a dwindling budget, containment failures, and molecule mutations with little help. And if you can't cure the virus before 10 containment failures, well, let's just say you get used to destroying the world after a few losses. I haven't played the physical version of the game, but the app has so many moving pieces and randomizers, it must be a beast on the table. I am so impressed with the quality of the Infection app. The design is modern and thematic, the UI is easy to pick up on, and overall it has almost all the features I'm looking for in a board game app. There's a tutorial that will teach you the basics of the game and UI, but there are also these scenarios that escalate in difficulty as new mechanics like technology and random events are introduced. And there's a tremendous amount of replayability in this app because, beyond the randomness inherent to the gameplay, there are all sorts of elements of the game that you can adjust to mix it up and increase the challenge. Infection is stressful to play, as the best solo games are. The brief story around the inception of the virus sets a dire tone, and with every failed containment or poorly timed mutation, the tension ratchets up. I will say the tone is so dark it may be off-putting for some, but for me, Infection Humanity's Last Gasp is an excellently designed and executed board game app that I'll be playing for a while. Give it a try. Hello Internet! Welcome back to How to Snakes. Today we're going to talk about a really important subject matter, money. You're not going to stay in business without it. Running a board game cafe is going to give you a lot of things to spend money on. You're going to have staff wages, rent, uh, physical objects like your cutlery, your tables, your chairs. You're going to have utilities. You're going to have games for your library. You're going to have replacement games for your library. So, the question is, where's the money come from? Now, if you're a restaurant first and you've got some games, then probably you don't want to have a cover charge, just because games aren't really your focus. But, if you're like us, and games are why people are here, and the food is sort of a secondary concern, then you want to make sure that your game library is profitable. Here at Snakes, we charge $5 a person. It's a flat fee, no in and out privileges, but essentially you can stay all day if you like. Now, there are some places that do other things. Some places don't charge at all. Some places will charge an hourly rate. Some people have a sliding hourly rate that drops the longer you stay. Other places, I guess they have higher rent than we do, they charge $10 or maybe even $15. Some board game cafes offer a membership deal. Whether it's monthly or yearly, they give people a break for unlimited amounts of visits. Now, this is something that we consider doing, and it's something that you should consider doing too. Consider it. We decided against it. That doesn't mean that you have to. Some board game cafes offer a premium charge for the ability to make reservations. Now, once upon a time, Snakes and Lattes offered reservations at no charge, and what we found was that people were booking so far in advance that they were forgetting about their reservations or just blowing them off. But the idea of charging for the right to reserve ahead of time, that's an interesting idea that we are thinking about. Whatever you do, remember you're a business, and if you can't at least break even, you're not going to be in business very long. If we didn't charge $5 for people to come and play, our games would have deteriorated and it would have been impossible for us to replace them and we would have gone out of business and no one would be playing any games. Well, that's about it for this Board Game Breakfast. Hey, we have a shout out. This Board Game Breakfast, one of our Kickstarter backers, John Paul, wants to encourage his wife, Melody, to play more games. You can do that if you want, Melody. 
Thank you, John, for supporting the Dice Tower. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you really enjoy this week. Uh, we have a lot of reviews we put up in the last several weeks, and we have many more, a lot of post-Gen Con stuff. Come back today at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and I'll answer some questions. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.